Thank you, Dr. Haider. It's, it's very good to be here. <clears throat> and thank you, Father Ellis, for having invited me. More than five, five years ago, Arab Uprising initiated in an unanticipated manner transformations in a region that seemed resistant to change. For some time, expectations and hopes energized the political process. Today's disillusionment, though understandable, is often rushed and at times it is engineered. It serves the purpose of justifying attempts to reverse changes or divert their course and withdraw into defensive and regressive identity politics. The weakness of state institutions, save security institutions that are strong, and the fragility of national cohesion and identity, exacerbated further by the rapid and unanticipated collapse of the old order, favored a tendency to overemphasize the strength of primordial ties in, com in contrast with the civic ties that are constitutive of a modern democratic society. One could not ignore the resurgence or perhaps the reinvention of sub-national identities and the centrifugal forces at work in many Arab countries. Many members of communities, not only minority communities, seem to have lost their aspiration to a state for all. They beg for a power structure that can protect them from another community. Weakened states, as well as political and electoral strategies of mobilization, have accentuated communalism and encouraged the surfacing of narratives of victimhood. Ethnic groups and ethnicized religious groups are both actors and victims of identity politics. Through the 20th century, their members struggled to assert themselves and be recognized as citizens. But many today have retreated into minority-centered communities. Some opted, if power relations permitted, for autonomy and advocated federalist or separated situations, solutions to the weakened states and fragmented societies. Expressions of identity politics are intertwined with post uprising conflicts. Many leaders across the region do little more than tap into the use of persecution felt by communities without offering them alternatives to fear and uncertainty. Many are victims. But ethnic and religious minorities, Christians included, claim extraordinary victimhood. There is a sort of competition for extraordinary victimhood. Think of Aleppo, where Eastern Aleppo is destroyed, bombarded day in, day out by the Syrian regime and the Russians, where people suffer, children, women, elderly, and think of West Aleppo, which is relatively peaceful. Now, who can claim extraordinary victimhood? The Christians in West Aleppo or the Muslims under the bombs in East Aleppo? Think of Iraq, Sanjar and Mosul. Both Christians of Mosul and Yazidis of Sanjar are victims. But who can claim extraordinary victimhood? 
the Yazidis. Uh, I know Kerry had thought of every, everything that has happened in Iraq as genocide, but uh, Yazidis may have been a target of genocide. Probably Christians have been a target of crimes against humanity and war crimes. So there is this competition, if I may use the word, over who is an extraordinary victim. And that's insane, I think, for victims are victims, whoever they are. The very conflict that undermine what is left of the state become, for many rulers in the region, a source of legitimacy, a cause for further entrenching a distraction from addressing problems that those governments are not capable or unwilling to solve, such as in Syria, Iraq, Libya, Bahrain, and Yemen. It is not, therefore, a surprise to see violence becoming a policy by default. Looking back at the transformations in the Arab world, one has enough reasons to fear that for quite some time, many countries will descend into disintegration, violence, and chaos. However, there are changes at work that could I'm not making a prediction here, could open the way for regeneration. The state system has fallen in Iraq. In Lebanon, state institutions have become largely dysfunctional. In Palestine, the two-state solution is increasingly more elusive. There's no peace process worthy of the name after it had become only a process with no end game in sight. No less disastrous is the difficulty of reconstructing a cohesive national entity in view of Hamas's tight control of Gaza and unwillingness to mend relations with the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. Egypt is still prey to a polarization between army and Islamists, depicted indiscriminately as terrorists, with a bloody confrontation triggered by a reversal of the political process augured by the 2011 uprising. In Syria, where a peaceful and rather secular uprising had to be militarized by necessity once the civilian population was repeatedly targeted by bloody repression, calls for decisive protection of civilians remained unanswered. The international community had no appetite for action. The Western military intervention in Libya, initially meant to protect civilian population in Benghazi, and at the same time, of course, serve the national interests of European countries that took part in the operation, failed in stabilizing Libya. Worse, it did not facilitate its transition into democracy. Such failures, the failures in Libya, were invoked as an argument for the justification of passivity in Syria. The regime's survival, Syrian regime's survival, largely attributed to Iranian and more recently Russian support, reveals an asymmetry that determines the course of the conflict which more than anywhere else in the region has extended beyond national borders. The massive influx of refugees into neighboring countries and its spill over into Europe, as well as the control of Daesh, ISIL, over swathes of territories are two illustrations of both regionalization and internationalization of what started as an internal conflict. Now, looking at the Christians throughout history, one should first state that it has been said before that the Christians of the Arab world have been recognized as communities in law and public conscience since the birth of Islam. The statute, or rather the pact of the Dhimma, while expecting their loyalty to the Islamic State, has protected them. Also, it implied, with protection, a measure 
of inferiorization, both civil and political. This recognition was a form of acceptance or even legitimization of religious plurality, which was deficient elsewhere in Latin Europe, for example. But I'm using uh, the expression of Maxime Rodinson, the French uh, Arabist. Uh, it was a pluralist society, but there was a sort of hierarchical pluralism. In several regions, Christians became a minority in terms of power relations before becoming a numerical minority, such as in Syria, where Christians outnumbered Muslims till the 12th century. Despite this, their contribution, the contribution of Christians to the formation of Arab Islamic civilization cannot be treated as marginal. Nevertheless, there were obvious limits because they were asked to be instrumental in building a society where religion, which was not theirs, was the cornerstone of legitimacy. Their role was confined to science, art, philosophy, and to servicing state institutions. This undeniably important role was weakened once the task which had defined it had been completed. Under the Ottomans, the Dhimma uh, system organizing pluralism reached its highest point of codification. The millets were both nations and religious communities and enjoyed relative autonomy. During the 19th century, the picture changed. The ideologies and political legal structures developed in Europe progressively penetrated the Arab Muslim world. On the other hand, European powers, tempted by the Ottoman weakness and having adopted an imperialistic attitude, developed relations with various minority communities. The leaders of these communities were not insensitive to the proposed assistance. In fact, hierarchical pluralism was exploited in favor of the needs of external domination. Christians were often faced with difficult choices. They deferred those choices according to character, religious affiliation, social condition, and political fluctuations. But on the whole, Christians, as of the later part of the 19th century, aspired to a citizenship, freed from direct or indirect do domination from abroad, while their fight for political and civil equality opposed them to the moribund uh, Ottoman Empire. It united them with Muslims in a national struggle for independence. For the majority of Christians, this combat was to continue against the European nations after they had shared the spoils of World, World, War, II, World War I. Thus, the stakes of the struggles for national liberation were not just the future of the majority communities, but also relationship between majorities and minorities. Collective identities had to be proposed in a way acceptable to different communities. In the later part of the 19th century and early 20th, Christians played a role in shaping a new social and political order, outweighing by far what their numerical importance seemed to allow. Their contribution, more in culture than in political activity, attempted to shake loose their minority status and identity. More than a century later, it remains uncertain whether their consciousness as a post-millet survived the tragedies, failures, and disappointments of the 20th century. A large number of Christians were opposed through to the separatist tendency of some of their co-religionists. They opted for modern nationalist and universalizing ideologies. They emphasized their common ethnic and cultural identity with Muslims on the basis 
of independence and modern nation building. The patriotic bond, if I may call it, cemented opposition to the Ottoman central and oppressive power, and later to dominating European powers. Thus, in the struggle for and achievement of independence, was established a pact of citizenship, superseding, in a way, the former Zimma Pact. The revolution of 1919 in Egypt was a case in point. In Palestine, the pact of citizenship was affirmed as Christians and Muslims suffered together its possession and ethnic cleansing. The opening of the 20th century suggested that a new society was in the making, but it was ruled by an old state. More than 100 years later, we see old society in, in, in new states. Primordial ties, those of kin, ethnicity, and religion, seem to command more loyalties than civic relations. The force of communal identities among Christians is not for them alone a problem to wrestle with. We ought to remember that loyalty to one's religious community deserves a more careful scrutiny. It is certainly a function of a combination of historical memory and spiritual impulse. It is strengthened in times of pressure or oppression against one's identity. Loyalty to a given religion, however, should not be assessed only in relation to critical situations. The strength of the bond that binds a religious community together is determined by a long-term tendency to seek comfort and security in abiding by traditional beliefs and customs. It has, to be sure, a protective function against abrupt and risky change. But religious identity in our part of the world and communal identity are not one and the same. Religiously identified institutions are influential in playing social and political role even if that when fewer numbers of people believe or practice the religion that such institutions represent. In some extreme cases, in some extreme cases, people fight in the name of religions in which they cease to believe. There are tensions and conflicts that have a religious past, but their religious content today is of no significance. You will hear more about the Shia Sunni conflict. Uh, religions in which people have little or no faith, continue to define communities in which they have much faith. There are times where faith in communities is far stronger than faith in one's religion. Break, breaking the cycle is not easy. Despotic regimes overplay fears and instrumentalize them. Christ, some, some Christian politicians exacerbate them for the purpose of mobilizing communities to dominate them while pretending protecting them. These same leaders, exacerbating mistrust vis-a-vis -vis Muslim majority and decrying their supposed indifference to Christians, make their co-religionists prisoners of an essentialist duality opposing majorities and minorities. Christians were constantly warned that the alternative to dictator regimes in Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, is Islamic fundamentalism, or even worse, chaos. Receptive to the alarmist discourse of despotic rulers, or used to succumb to their pressure and to their occasional favors, a number of Christians from different walks of life chose to passively support whom they perceived as secular, even if authoritarian, regimes. They thought that stability 
ensured their survival as minorities. While the popular uprising carried the risk of an open-ended instability and the threats of an uncertain future. Fearing the possibility of their marginalization, they seem to retreat into what is likely to be a process of political self-marginalization and regrettably moral resignation. Conversely, we find among various Christian communities in the Arab world, many whose concerns could not justify shying away from the yearning for freedom and democracy and from active participation in movements for change. To a limited extent, both attitudes polarized Christians throughout our recent history. Christians are not a monolith in this sense. There were times where minority-centered consciousness of some was transcended by those who advocated causes cutting across communal barriers and in so doing tried, as I said, to shake loose their minority status. Their role in the making of the new social and political order was remarkable. The disproportionately influential contribution of Christians in the modern movement of Nahda, Renaissance, Arab awakening, might explain why its promises, the promises of that movement, seemed in retrospect today more far-reaching than what was possible in subsequent history. Furthermore, the often justified disappointment of many paved the way for some to a bitter withdrawal and to what you may call a preservationist survivalism and conservatism. Many Christians experience anxiety arising from the effects of their dwindling numbers, the accumulated economic difficulties, thinning political participation and anguish in the face of mounting Islamism. However, the community specific anxiety could not overshadow the fact that the worries of Christians are lived and expressed mutatis mutandis by a considerable number of Muslims. Christians are victims and so are Muslims. A number of Muslim voices acknowledge that while Christians, while Christians have their reasons to be disquiet, their difficulties reflect the problems within the society as a whole. To be sure, the liberation of Christians, and I'm quoting an Egyptian intellectual, Tariq al-Bishri, to be sure, the liberation of Christians would be a necessary condition for the liberation of Muslims. Whilst accepting the particular character of Christian apprehension, Many Muslims recognize in the Christian anxiety an unease of their own. For most often, it's not the relationship between a Muslim majority and the Christian minority that is at stake, but it's justice for all, political participation, an inclusive political participation, human rights, national dignity. I'm about to finish. Five minutes, yes, thank you. For many decades, church leaders have tried to accompany their faithful along this very arduous road. More often than not, they privileged the risk of existing, we heard it today, the risk of existing over the fear of disappearing. They refrained from overplaying minority militancy and identity politics. The notion of Christian presence, we've heard Cardinal Luigi Sandri this morning, uh, the notion of their Christian presence was their antidote to aggressive communalism, minority-centered communalism, or withdrawal from public life. The role of church institutions, as we saw this morning, was defined 
not only in terms of their functions of preservation, but by the gospel-rooted imperative of witness and service to the neighbor. Church has never perceived Christians and Muslims as two monolithic blocks facing each other, nor did they oppose the rights of minorities to the aspirations of majorities. Today, Christians and church leaders are reminded by their Muslim compatriots of their own history. No matter how legitimate is their anxiety in the present times of uncertainty, they need not succumb to a sort of irremediable, definitive fear. Exaggerated fear is commonly provoked and manipulated, used by despotic rulers who take hostages the Christian minorities, linking their fate to their own and terrifying them about their future. Descending into engineered fear may endanger their ability, the ability of Christians to contribute towards shaping their own future and that of their nations. In addition, it alienates them from the majority of their people if they resign from their ethical obligation to condemn oppressive violence and injustice, whoever, whoever are the victims. The loss of memory favors generalization. One of them is to claim that Christians, for example, support Assad and recognize in him the protector from fanaticism and discrimination, failing to see the sad reality that they have become in the political sense, one of his human shields. Be that as it may, Christians do not hide their deep concern about what is witnessed in Syria, nor do they deny their fears about the future. In conclusion, there is a third way that could contrast with the path walked by those who opt for an exclusively minority-centered militancy and those who choose the silence of fear, resignation, and emigration. Those who choose the silence of fear, resignation, or emigration. The third way is opened by the reinvention through political participation of the pact of citizenship that binds Christians and Muslims together, and the renewal of the role played during the early 20th century awakening movement. To be sure, a new political and social order is in the making, in blood and tears. And therefore, the pact of citizenship that was a determining factor in various independence movements in the past is to be reclaimed. It is needless to say that the future of Christians in the Arab world does not only depend on them, <laughs> but it depends on the attention that their fellow Muslims, co-citizens, may give to them. Christians deserve, but also need to be worthy of, not just deserve, but they need to be worthy of an attention that is not condescending, but motivated by the sense of common good and the recognition of wealth of the wealth of religious and cultural plura plurality that could spare the Arab world the sad face of uniformity. Finally, we should not forget that times of uncertainty and fear are also times of change. The tension of turning victims into actors may not be resolved in the near future. We will continue to be victims for quite a while before we would become actors. And I'm not talking about Christians, I'm talking about Christians and Muslims. Recognizing the present fragmentation and communalization is inevitable, but designing political system that mirrors them assumes that they are never changing realities. Voices suppressed today will not be voices silenced forever. In the midst of chaos and destruction, the emergence of forces striving towards citizenship and national unity may become, rather than an impossible dream, they may become a principle of hope.
Thank you very much.